Welcome to Northview Church Online and Easter Sunday. We are thrilled that you have chosen to join us today as we celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. In just a few moments, we will spend time in worship, prayer, and then Pastor Greg will share a very special message this morning. Now, if you're new to Northview Church, please take a moment to visit mynorthview.church to learn all about us. And when you're ready, we would love to connect with you. We want to hear from you right now, and Jennifer Jones is our Facebook virtual door greeter. She's ready to welcome you this morning, so why don't you drop a note in the comments to let us know you were here, and also feel free to share one thing you were thankful for today. Now, as we navigate virtual church together, you may experience some technical difficulties along the way. If you do, please message us on Facebook, and we'll try to help you out. Or if you go to our website, mynorthview.church, there's a link to take you to the YouTube delivery, which may work better. Now, this is the time where we would normally ask everyone to shake hands and introduce themselves, but instead, please send us a virtual fist bump or comment so we can pray together this morning. Now, let's spend some, uh, let's spend some time together in worship as Megan leads our worship time this morning. Good morning, church. How wonderful is it that we can still celebrate our risen Savior together, even if we're not physically together. I hope that you're still singing with me and celebrating what the Lord has done. Christ rose from the grave and He declared our sins to be gone. A great day. Let's sing again.
Jesus. 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 How sweet the sound, how magnificent the name, how miraculous the sacrifice that changed the world forever. Celebrated as the king with cheers, excitement, laughter. He's coming. He'll save us. But then the darkness knocked on his door. He opened it. He let it in. He didn't save himself from torture or death. This was his blood. This was his body. Poured out for everything I'd ever done. He was laid in total darkness. We were alone, without hope. We thought it was over. Until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. There is no grave that can hold him. That immovable stone moved. Dark grave, filled with light. He came back for me. He overcame everything I couldn't. My sin, the grave meant for me. The penalty that I was supposed to take. The end of me now has a beginning. His triumph, his death, his reign, his heart. He conquered death. And the miracle that was meant for the whole world is also the miracle just for me. Just for me. Just for me. Jesus. How sweet the sound.
Good morning, Northview Church and any guests that we may have. I am so excited to be able to celebrate Easter with you, even if it's across the internet, doing this online from the comfort of our homes. It is a joy to celebrate our risen Lord and Savior with you this morning. You know, Easter is one of my favorite days of the year. It's not like there's any surprises coming, right? Today, we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to just talk about truth. Today isn't a gotcha day. Today, everyone knows what is coming. Easter is the perfect time of year for someone to explore their faith. If you have questioned whether you want to be a Christian or not, if you have thought about becoming a Christian but have kind of put it off, Easter, this story that we talk about today, is the perfect time for you to make that decision in your life. And in full transparency, this is not a gotcha day. We're going to talk about the resurrection, and here in just a little while, we're going to give you an opportunity, and we're going to ask you and invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ today. Maybe you have some, some objections to being a Christian. Well, the Easter story is the kind of story that gets around all of those objections. So today I want to challenge you to at least consider becoming a Christian. At least come in with an open mind. At least give it some thought as we go into this. Even if you've kind of been going about being a Christian but haven't fully committed, I want to challenge you today to fully commit your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've had a really bad church experience. Maybe something has caused you to, to question your faith or to question the need for faith. I challenge you to take a hard look today at committing your life to Jesus in spite of any unanswered prayers that you may have had, in spite of any people who you may have known who were Christians but were living it out in a way that didn't honor Christ. In spite of all those things, in spite of the Christians you may have known in the past, those you may have worked with or those you may have went to school with, I want to invite you today to at least consider what the Bible has to say about Jesus. You see, the foundation of our Christian faith isn't Christians. The foundation of our faith is not the people who walk around claiming Christ. It's not answered prayers. The foundation of our faith isn't even a Sunday morning service. The foundation of our faith is what we celebrate today. The foundation of our faith is Easter. Andy Stanley once called it history's greatest mystery. And Easter addresses something that there is no other plausible explanation for. And that's the church. Millions of people this morning gathering online all around the world are celebrating this Jewish carpenter. This guy who only ministered for three years. He was never on television, never had a radio show. He never held any public office. Yet, over one-third of the world's population will celebrate him in some way today. There is no plausible explanation for how this could possibly be except for the story of Easter. History's mystery. We look through history and we see these, these people who are well known. We know about Nero, but people know almost nothing about Nero except that he fed Christians to lions and that he became a footnote in Christian history. Caesar Augustus, he made all kinds of reforms, yet we have no idea what many of them were. But on every Christmas, we speak his name and we read the story of the birth of Jesus. He became a footnote in Christian history. 300 years after the crucifixion, with no Bible to reference, with no Sunday school lessons to go by, how did the church survive? How did the church survive the persecution of Rome? It is a great mystery. Romans and Jewish leaders ganged up to stomp out the Christian movement. No more Roman Empire exists, though. 
And there are far more Christians in this world than there are Orthodox Jews. So how did it survive? It is a mystery. And the answers to these questions is why you should consider really committing your life to Jesus Christ today. All movements have things in common. Movements begin with a charismatic leader. And when that leader goes on, whether it's death or, or locked up in a prison, when that leader is no longer available, his followers take hold of that. And they continue with the message of that leader and that movement. When they die, their followers pick up the burden of leadership and keep their teaching alive. One would assume that that is what happened with the early church. That was, one would assume that was the case with Jesus, that his followers picked up after his death and they continued, that they fought to keep the dream alive. But that isn't the case with Christianity. There is no serious historian who embraces that theory, who says that the followers fought to keep the dream alive after his death. And that is why this is such a mystery in history. So how did it happen? How does the church survive for all of these thousands of years? It doesn't fit the typical paradigm of a movement because Jesus' message was a problem. The first problem with Jesus' message was that he didn't advocate for liberation of the people. He didn't come along pushing a revolution. His message wasn't unique. He, his teaching was on love and it was based on the teachings of the Old Testament. The newer aspects of his teaching were impractical. Pray for your enemies. Pay taxes. He gave guidelines for marriage. All of these things in a society that would seem impractical. His message wasn't appealing. And it affirmed a Jewish law. There was nothing unique about it. There was no revolutionary theme. There was no overthrow language to what Jesus was teaching. And the second biggest problem with his message is that it revolved all around him. He never called on his followers to trust in his ideas he never taught and said, these are the things that you should trust in. He instructed his followers one thing, trust in him. This makes the, the rise of Christianity totally unexplainable. It is not the way that movements have happened all throughout history. It is unexplainable were it not for what we celebrate today on Easter. You know, when you look at Jesus, it wasn't his ideas that got him into trouble. It was who he claimed to be. To Lazarus' sisters, they were upset because he wasn't there when their brother, Lazarus, had died. But his claim in John chapter 11 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. To his apostles, they were asking to see the Father. And in John chapter 14, Jesus says this, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Never once did Jesus and never once did any of his followers indicate that Jesus came to leave us with some collection of insights or parables and principles to pass on to the next generation. None of Jesus' followers ever indicated or even implied that the reason Jesus came was to leave us some new teaching that we could pass on to the next generation. The problem was his message. Jesus did not come and try to start a revolution. His message was all about himself. And when Jesus died... Their hopes died with him. The movement died. Jesus was the center of the message, and it just didn't make sense anymore if he was dead. 
So when his disciples watched him die, they watched this movement die with him. The mission died with him because unlike anyone else, Jesus claimed to be the mission. When Jesus died, no one believed his message. When Jesus died, no one believed his claims. When Jesus died, the movement died. Even before he died, his followers, the ones who were committed to him, scattered. They were cowards. Peter, one of the greatest apostles in scripture, Peter denied him, knowing him, denied knowing him on the eve of his crucifixion. Just a few weeks before this, a few days before this, Peter said, you are the Christ. Yet the night Jesus is arrested, he says, I don't know him. Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark, they all share the same story. There are no heroes in this story. Nobody stood up for their guy. This is why that we believe their accounts of what happened. Because if they had made this up, someone would have been the hero. They would have made themselves look good. Someone would have been faithful. But Peter, the, the one who is known as the rock, Peter was the least faithful of them all. Another thing we see here is that messiahs don't die. The Son of God cannot be killed. You can't crucify the resurrection and the life. Yet, Jesus was crucified and died. The mystery of history is how do we go from that scenario to one 300 years later when the emperor of Rome declares Christianity to be legal and even becomes a Christian himself? The answer has nothing to do with what Jesus taught. Easter solves the mystery of history. On Sunday morning, after the Passover, we read this in John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. At this moment in history, as Mary Magdalene goes and finds this empty tomb, no one assumes a resurrection. No one assumes that, yes, Jesus is alive. They just assume his body has been taken by the officials. And they wonder, where is Jesus' body? We don't know where they have laid him, the passage says. But then in Luke chapter 24, we read this. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But something happened. And we read about it in John chapter 20. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been used on Jesus' head, not lying in the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went and he saw and he believed. And then Jesus appears to a couple of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he appears while they're out walking. And when he appears to them, they don't even recognize who he is. But once they realize this was Jesus, they run back to tell the others. And this is what we read in Luke chapter 24. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. And he said to them, peace to you. Jesus' followers, they did not re-engage with the mission because of something that Jesus taught. Jesus' followers re-engaged because of someone that they saw. And that person 
was Jesus Christ. That is what compelled them to move forward with the mission. The message of the early church was not Jesus' teaching. It wasn't his parables. The message of the early church was the resurrection. They would preach, you killed him. God raised him and we have seen him. Luke, who carefully recorded the events in his gospel and in the book of Acts, explains what happens next. Jesus' followers went into the streets of Jerusalem and began to proclaim not to love one another, not the parable of the good Samaritan, not blessed are the whoever. They proclaimed the risen Jesus Christ from the dead. That is what their mission hinged on. Peter would preach, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. What shall we do? They would ask. Acts chapter 3 verse 15, you killed the author of life, God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to this fact. And then in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Peter replied when they asked, what shall we do with this? Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is risen. And church, we are invited to rise with him. We were invited to share the message of the resurrection with a fallen world. His resurrection is what gives us hope even in the darkest of days. Even in the uncertainty of this time in our life, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that brings us hope. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that restores us to a Savior. The resurrection of Jesus, it solves history's greatest mystery. How could a church survive the events that happened? It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And more importantly, the resurrection of Jesus resolves another great mystery. What do we do with our sin? What do we do with our past? The resurrection... The resurrection of Jesus punctuated the point of his crucifixion. The forgiveness of sin. That was the whole point of what Jesus did. And if he rose from the dead, we can trust what he said about his own death. If someone comes and predicts his own death and his own resurrection and he pulls it off, that's someone we can trust. The reason that you can trust that he rose from the dead is that there's no other explanation to how we know he lived. Don't be simplistic about this. We don't believe Jesus rose from the dead just because the Bible says so. We believe because Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, and Paul We're all eyewitnesses to this fact. We believe because they told us they saw him. And there is no contradiction anywhere in history to the facts that they report. The story, it made them look bad. It made them look weak. It made them look like they had no faith. It made them look scared. But they didn't care. Because they had the truth to share. The resurrection of Christ solves history's greatest mystery. So if you are a Christian, you can live with confidence that your prayers matter. That what the Bible says is true and God is listening to your prayers. You can live with confidence that your faithfulness matters. You can live with confidence that your generosity matters. There is a purpose there is a mission and we believe it because of the resurrection 
if you are not a Christian, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you should. Nobody else offers eternal life. I want to offer you an invitation that has been offered for 2,000 years. An invitation to come into a a relationship with Jesus Christ. We read the story of the resurrection and see that Jesus died on a cross and three days later rose again. And we celebrate that on Easter. But what we really celebrate is that His death on a cross and His defeat of death three days later gives us the opportunity to be restored to God. Without a relationship with God, our hope does not exist. Without a relationship of God, we are destined for an eternity in a place called hell, separated from God forever. But because of the resurrection, we have the hope of being restored into a relationship with Jesus Christ, restored into a relationship with the Father and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the only hope that we have in times such as these and in all days of our lives. Jesus died a sinner's death on a cross even though He was a perfect man for you. He died because He loves you. And if you want that hope in your life, I want to give you the invitation today to accept that hope. And here's all you have to do. It is the easiest thing to do, yet it is not simple. It's a free gift, but it costs everything. And here's why. The only thing that Jesus requires of you is to accept Him as your Savior and to commit your life to Him. It's a free gift, but it does require commitment. And if you're willing today to admit that you're a sinner and to admit that the only way to be restored to God is by trusting in Jesus Christ and to commit to following Him the best that you can for the rest of your life, then say a prayer expressing that to Him. Just say a prayer something like this. Father, I know that I'm broken and I'm a sinner and I need hope. And I believe that the resurrection is the only thing that offers that hope. So God, I don't know what this is all about. I don't understand it yet, but I do believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin and was resurrected three days later. So Lord, forgive me. Help me turn to you. Help me to commit my life from this day forward to following Jesus. It's in his name. Amen. If you express that prayer for the very first time in your life, then you are restored into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's at this moment that you have hope for eternity. I ask you to share that with us, to to let us know that you have made that commitment so that we can walk through the next steps of following Jesus with you. We're not going to blow up your phones. We're not going to drive you crazy. We just want to help you along the path. So if you would send us a private message on Facebook, just let us know your decision. Or if you would go over to mynorthview.church and click on I have decided and just let us know what your decision is today. We would love to walk through the next steps with you. As we close this morning, we want to celebrate the risen King that death has been defeated. Megan's going to lead us in one more song. If you would join with us, and I'll be back in just a few moments.
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was a ransom, my life began. Oh, your grace. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, you made so free. As we close, we like to close with a time of worship through giving. We believe that giving of our first fruits of our best is the way that we honor God. and We believe it's required by God to give of our best. So this is a time where we take up our tithes and offerings. And uh, usually during a service, we pass a plate around, but we can't do that today, obviously. So we have three ways that you can give. You can give via text by texting any amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Or you can go on our website, mynorthview.church, and click on Give, and you can give that way. Or you can mail us a check and do it the old-fashioned way to P.O. Box 488, Kodak, Tennessee, 37764. And as you Decide how you'd like to give. Let me just share with you some of the things that we're able to do with what you give. Just this week, we were able to, to go and honor the heroes of this COVID-19 crisis at Children's Hospital. And we were able to share with them $500 in gift cards that, that'll get them a meal or coffee or an ice cream or whatever they would like at Chick-fil-A. We're able to honor, we will honor some this week in our local community, some of those who are on the front lines of this COVID-19 crisis, some of the essential workers who are our heroes keeping us going during this time. We're able to help with food banks to, to feed people during this time. And we've been able to set aside a fund for those in need of assistance, all because of your generosity, your giving, and your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray over our giving this morning and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you so much 
for all that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to give. So Lord, from our first and our best, we give you our tithes and our offerings. And we ask you, Father, to use this money, use these resources to reach people with the gospel, with the truth and the hope of the resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope that even as you sit at home um, celebrating this Easter Sunday, that it is a great Easter Sunday. This should give you some time to focus on the Lord. So today, as you remember His sacrifice for you, don't dwell on His death. Celebrate His life. Because He is resurrected, we have hope. I can't wait to see you next week. I hope that you have a great week and we'll be back here to worship with you next Sunday morning.